okay? Pray for our ladies. They're on their way home. Get amen, husbands. Amen. Amen. And we're going to have a long recording. Oh, you talk about fuel. I would have some good fuel. Uh, we're so happy for them. They look like they've had a great time, and that's where they're at now. They're in a, uh, on their way home here in a moment. Let's pray for their safety. And uh, we're thankful they can get away and enjoy the weekend. And uh, we're so thankful. Did, you gonna throw that picture up there? Did anybody yeah, what they were doing? They all took the picture with Max and Cato, and uh, he was at uh, Oak Hills this morning. And then I get a picture on my phone, okay, of Amy talking to him. And I thought to myself, she keeps every pastor straight there is in the whole state of Texas. <laughs> she keeping them straight. So we're happy for them. We're in John chapter three again. If you have a copy of God's Word, and we're looking at developing a Christian worldview. We started this a couple weeks ago, the greatest need of every person in John chapter 3. We're asking this question, how does God see people, the masses of humanity? And this is the answer. I believe that all people are loved by God and need Jesus as their Savior. That's how Jesus sees the masses of humanity. They are loved by him and they need his son. And we're studying John chapter 3 and we're looking in detail at this interview between Jesus and Nicodemus. Last time we met, we dealt with the greatest tragedy of Nicodemus and his beliefs. He was religious, he was rich, but he was extremely confused. He was blind, as we read in verses 3 through 9, because he could not figure out the how of what Jesus was saying. Now let me tell you, Jesus in John chapter 3 is not pushing for this new birth experience in Nicodemus' life. He's not pushing for him to make an on-the-spot, instantaneous decision at that very moment. What he is putting in front of him is this. You must be born again. That is a need that every individual has. And so back and forth this interview goes, and we saw that the tragedy is, was very tragic, and that is the fact that Nicodemus kept asking how, how, how. So we're going to sort of pick up where we left off, and that's in verse number 6. And we see here that Nicodemus' need for the new birth is sort of explained to him by Jesus. And Jesus does this by using two very fitting illustrations. Look in verse number 6. If you have a copy of God's Word, John chapter 3. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto you, or unto thee, ye must be born again. Verse number 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. First of all, Jesus said, this is new birth that I'm speaking to you about, Nicodemus, is talking about two different worlds here. We're talking about two different spheres here. And he says this in verse number 6 and verse number 7. See, Nicodemus had experienced a natural birth. And he understood that natural birth process. We don't we talked about that. None of us had anything to do with our own birth. None of us did. And so, this is the level that Nicodemus is on. Nicodemus needed to experience not only this natural birth, but what Jesus is saying is, Nicodemus, you need to experience a spiritual birth. And Nicodemus could not wrap his religious mind around this. Now here is the, uh, the great uh, dictum of Genesis 1. Everything is made after its kind. If you read Genesis 1, it made it after its kind. They reproduce after its kind. And so here's the simple law of nature. No one kind can evolve into some other kind. Okay? Cats don't evolve into dogs, and, and, and monkeys don't evolve into men. Right. All right? And so we need to understand, and this is what Jesus is telling him. Jesus is saying, listen, each creature reproduces after its own kind. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, Nicodemus. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit, is what Jesus is saying. And what he's really saying is this. Fallen men, sinful men, men who are not regenerated, can only re reproduce fallen men. Right. Flesh after flesh, spirit after spirit. What people need more than anything else, they need a change of worlds. 
They need to change the world. They need to come out of the natural into the spiritual realm. And that's exactly what Nicodemus, uh, Nicodemus need to understand. To have spiritual life, one must be born of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that imparts life to our souls. The life he imparts is not just any old life. It is God's life. He puts it into us. Now here's what you need to understand. When sin came in to mankind, the Spirit left. And we were, what, left dead. Dead in our trespasses and sins. But listen to this. Once we are cleansed and forgiven and justified, guess who moves back in? The Holy Spirit of God. And that's exactly what Jesus is trying to tell Nicodemus here. It's a miracle. What happens is, is a whole other world is opened up to you. A world that you're not accustomed to living in. Fallen men reproduce fallen men. We need to be born of the Spirit. So the second illustration that he gives is the wind. Verse number 8. The wind has its own laws, loved ones. Here's some things you need to know about the wind. You don't stand outside and tell the wind how to blow, when to blow, what direction to blow in. It operates on its own laws. In both of the Greek and Hebrew here in verse, uh, verse number 8, the wind and spirit are the exact same identical word. Okay? What was taking place here is this. Both of them are invisible. You can't see them. Both of them can be sensed, though, when they're moving. Yeah. And see, what's happening here in Nicodemus' life is the Spirit of God in the wind is moving across his soul. Right? That's why he keeps asking the question, how? How can this be? How can this be? How can this be? The Spirit is moving in his life. You see, my friend, the presence of both are revealed by their effects. And Nicodemus is being affected right now by everything Jesus told him. He didn't realize it, but the wind was moving across his heart and across his life. Now, let me tell you this. The wind of the Spirit was blowing into his soul. It is imperative that when the wind begins to blow in your soul, and it begins to convict you of your need as it was doing to Nicodemus, the evidence is there. It's undeniable. And whether you sense it or not, the Spirit is working, regenerating, and renewing. What is needed here is a response to the wind. And so this is exactly what Jesus was telling him. Jesus is saying, look, Nicodemus, you keep asking me how. You keep asking me how. How can this be? How can this be? Listen, number one, I'm talking about two different worlds here, Nicodemus. You live in a natural world. You know anything and everything that has to do with the natural level of things. Listen, that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. And let me give it to you this way, Nicodemus. It's a miracle. The, the wind operates on its own laws, Nicodemus. But here's the fact. When it begins to blow, when you begin to see the leaves rustling, you need to react to that, Nicodemus. Amen. When the Spirit is moving, you react to its moving. And it's what? It's convicting. And it's what? It's revealing to you that you need to be born again. Amen. And so we come out to this part. Nicodemus, we've seen the great tragedy. If you would now look at verse number 11, here's the world's greatest truth. We've seen the world's greatest tragedy. Here's a religious man coming to Jesus, blind by his religion, cannot figure out how, cannot figure out how. Jesus keeps telling him and telling him and him telling him, not with the intent to push a decision at that very moment at night. He was just making it known to this man that, listen, you and not only you, but every man in this whole world must be born again. And you cannot think on the, on the natural level. That which is flesh is flesh. Okay? That which is spirit is spirit. See, it's hard for a religious person to understand spiritual things. They can't do it. Because let me tell you something. We're going to find out right now. Jesus sort of just knocks a hole in Nicodemus' religion that he's holding on to. I mean, he knocks a huge hole in it. Okay? Look at verse number 11, if you would. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know and testify that we have seen. You receive not our witness. He just kicked the hole right in it. Jesus kicked the hole right in. He said, all right, here's the deal, Nicodemus. We're going to get all this stuff out of the way. Now, everything I've said from verse 10 and over, we get everything I've just said. Here's the deal. We spoke, we speak what we know and what we've seen. You don't receive our witness. 
Look what verse 12 says. If I have told you earthly things, and you believe not, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, Nicodemus. If I've told you earthly things and you don't believe, look what he says in verse number 12. Isn't it amazing how Jesus turns the how back on him now? Look what he says. How shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? You can't figure the how out. So how many ask you this? How, can I, how shall you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Look at verse 13. And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. Now let's stop right there just for a minute. Let's look at the greatest truth. First of all, Jesus in verses 11 through 12 gives us the secret to being born again. Here's the secret. As this interview begins to unfold, and this, this, this conversation between these two men starts to just unravel before us, Jesus for the third time gives one of these barely barelys in here. Okay, Look at verse number 3 in your Bible. Jesus answered and said unto him, What? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Look at verse number 5, what he says. Jesus answered, What? Verily, verily. He gives three of these. Now we have one in verse number 11. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know. Three emphatic, important points he's pressing home here. This strong affirmation. You know what he's telling Nicodemus? Hey, listen up. I'm fixing to tell you something that is very important for you to hear. Three times he tells him this. What is he trying to tell him? Well, number one, Jesus, in verse 11, some great facts are revealed. Here is the verse. Jesus draws a line in the sand. Verse 11 is Jesus drawing the line in the sand and saying, okay. And he separates. And look at verse number 11. He said, I say unto thee, we, and then he goes on down and he says what? Let us not apart. And ye, he drew the line in the sand. We know what we're talking about. We know what we've seen, Nicodemus, Jesus said. But you, what's it say? Do not receive our witness. He draws the line. He separates the spiritual from the religious. He said, we're, we're, we're dealing with two different things here, Nicodemus. There is us and there is you. Now, Jesus is not doing this to be sarcastic, brother. Jesus is not doing this to look his nose down. He's trying to press a point home to this man that has come to him wondering about the miracles that he just saw him do in the temple and all that other. Jesus gets to the heart of the matter. And he said, this guy here is not getting it. He said, no, we and ye, we will be Jesus and his followers. We the ones that have chosen to trust Jesus and accept him at his words. And then there's the ye, those that are blind leaders leading the blind, those that are whited sepulchers on the outside but full of dead man's bones, religious. Here's the deal. This is what Jesus said. Nicodemus, it has nothing to do with your religion. There's nothing religious about what I'm telling you. You cannot understand and wrap your mind around this on the level of a religious man. You know, the Bible said that the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit. And that's exactly the level Nicodemus was on. You see, religion keeps us on a natural level. Sure. Sure. It puts all the emphasis on how I can conjure up ways to get to God. Right. Come that's religion. And that's yeah. exactly what the Pharisees did. They took God's law, added their law, and their law became even superior to God's law of Israel. Yeah. They made up all these ideals and all these uh, laws and all these ways of thinking and put these, as Jesus would say, heavy yokes upon these people. Yeah. So Jesus said, whom the Son of Man sets free, they are free indeed. There are no religious laws and rituals and rules. Listen, there's a different law that we live by now with an emphasis of grace and mercy. Yeah. We've been liberated, loved ones. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. Right. Right? And so Jesus is saying to this guy, listen, there's you and there's us. Nicodemus began this interview with a similar statement. Look what he says in verse number two. You got your Bibles open? The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we, we, see it there? We know that thou, there it is, the separation, we know thou, us religious people, 